Testing, testing. Uh, really hoping this doesn't uh, just destroy eardrums or just have a really annoying hum in the background. Uh, having some technical difficulties, but this is Professor Haystacks in what, April of 2023. You may note that this video is going up in 2023, despite My Little Pony Friendship is Magic ending in 2019, uh, if you don't count the clip shows. This was actually recorded in January 2021, which is still quite a ways after. Um, then life happens. Uh, I got a new job and various things, and I couldn't uh, get this done in a timely fashion. So you'll note at a certain point, the images stop and just go for still images. Uh, that is just so I could finish something, even if it's two years late here. Uh, this will be the penultimate long form video for this channel, uh, at least unless there's some sort of reunion special for My Little Pony Fr Friendship is Magic. Uh, there may be some shorts or maybe a talking head video like this where I'm just on here for 10 minutes ranting about something. But uh, season five, or not season, generation five just doesn't excite me as much, uh, doesn't make me want to go and do poses and things in that style in any way. It's actually harder because they're all 3D. Uh, anyway, um, I'll try to get the last video, long form video from this channel out, I mean, in 2023. Um, it's going to be all still, so it should be less trouble to do it. But the ending of that one was never recorded. You'll, you'll see a talking head like this in front of that one. Uh, for now, please uh, with please uh, enjoy. I'm not editing that at this point. This has been taking too long. Please enjoy this Season 9 review Rose and I did back in January of 2021. And that's how one unicorn found a new type of family. That's all for story time today. Aww. I'll be back the same time next week. Run along and find your parents, every pony. The library is closing soon. I know that went better than my talk. <laughs> your material may be a little too advanced for them. <sighs> It's a tough balance to hit. Last time, most of the foals already knew everything I was saying. Foals will surprise you like that. The history of Equestria is quite interesting. I mean, just look at the past few moons. Princess Celestia and Princess Luna retired, three major villains returned, and a council of friendship was established. Ugh. Don't get me started on how poorly thought out that was. It's the Tantibus all over again. That seems kind of cynical. Well, you know what? I'm already doing a review of the last problem with Bobby, so let's just do a general overview here. Well, alright. I think I have time. Mostly out of character from here on, fans. Do, 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 do. Alright, so we start with uh, the beginning of the end. The title seems a bit on the nose. Yeah, my problem is that the title only makes sense if you already know this is the last season. I'd kind of rather relate to the episode itself. Well, that aside, it has some good points. We have some nice mysterious atmosphere with the villains being freed. And when Sombra takes over, I can't help but wonder how he ruled a kingdom for so many years. Yeah, I've seen an interesting theory that this Sombra is actually a projection by Grogar to keep the other three in line. Well, that would explain why Sombra looks and sounds different here. That just bothered me. Eh, it's animation. I don't mind changing voice actors that much. It gives the show more longevity. But it's the last season. For now, but that's another review. Anyway, the princess's retiring really belongs in part two. It would give the audience time to take in both Grogar showing up and the retirement of two of the most powerful beings that the show has seen. Well, the organization definitely needed work. Twilight gives some pushback, but it's presented as a done deal. It's take over or the kingdom falls apart, essentially. No real consideration for what she wants. It makes a nice bookend. 
It could have had they followed through, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Why does the elements being destroyed matter? They were destroyed way back in Season 1, Episode 2, and it didn't matter. Maybe it's the destroying of the tree? But it wasn't even really destroyed. Right, we'll get to that. So, Discord's acting a bit much here. It's called the actor paradox. The character is already being played by an actor, so if you show them acting, it's correspondingly difficult. Regardless, you should really have toned it down here. Although he nearly got me with that speech. On that we agree, but let's move on. Uprooted is next, and we see the tree didn't die either. Honestly, this feels like a reboot of Castle Sweet Castle. Hmm. I think I see what you mean. Not so much the plot per se, but the themes of the episode are nearly note for note. With the student six instead of the main six. You know, there's no real Twilight role, but otherwise, yeah. My feeling when I first saw this was that it felt like it was an 11-minute short stretched into 22 minutes. Yeah, it feels like they could have done more of this, but up next is one of my favorites, Sparkles 7. In my opinion, the best episode of the season, and one of the few that really feels like MLP to me. It's very cool that they let the VAs write it. And it shows. There's a lot more care for the characters here. They even address Spike's position in the Sparkle Clan, which has been a nagging fan question since Season 1. Luna's face in here, too. I love her expression with the reveal. Sephiroth's still a creep. He feels like a low-budget Gaston. Thankfully in an amusing, non-threatening sort of way. One wonders why he keeps trying the way he does. He's not obsessed with Rainbow to the point of stalking her or anything. But neither do they seem to have eyes for any pony else, while she's pretty clearly not interested. Yeah, it does make you wonder if they kissed or something in the past, and Sephiroth just can't get over it. That would explain a lot. Let's go on to Point of No Return. I don't really have much to say here. The whole episode is just Twilight being Twilight. Well, more specifically, it's Twilight being true to her character from seasons 1 through 6. It's also the last outing by GM Barrow, at this point one of those that had been around the longest. She started on chapter books, right? Yes, and except for the first one, they're excellent. It's how she got invited to write episodes. She does chafe a bit under the page limits. If she wrote a novel, I'd want to read it. Um... A quick search shows that she's written a few other properties, like Spirit, too. Huh, and a picture book for Clueless, that movie from 1995. That book was in 2020. What's up with that? Guess it means she's not doing pony books anymore? Yeah, Hasbro really should have kept those going, both for the fans and to keep Barrow under contract, although she is writing for Pony Life. That's a bit of a tangent, though. Right, right, sorry, I just like her work. This episode is the second best of the season, in my opinion. Twilight's in character, Moondancer finally gets another speaking role, and we have some interesting world building. Which sort of comes back later. The one at the end of the season is a different Shoals. Yeah, that was probably an oversight, though they've tried to paper over it after the fact and say that they're by the same body of water. Also, Twilight learns about not panicking again. It's a different take on it, though, which is nice. And it wasn't done nearly as much as Fluttershy's shyness. True. So, common ground. I can relate to Wind Sprint here. It probably seems to her like Quivel Pants is trying to replace her dad. Yeah, but the resulting lesson is really for the adult side of things. I think it's fine to have that every now and then. I'm just saying they could have done both. Quibble listens to Rainbow Dash's bad advice longer than necessary, so some of that time could have gone into, say, Scootaloo hearing Windsprint's side of things and discussing that she knows on some level she's not being fair. Yeah, that's an emotional reaction. So you didn't like it? Actually, it's fine. I'm picking at the details on this one. The basics are sound and it's competently executed. All I'm saying is with another editing pass or two at the script, it could have been a great episode, but it's merely good as it is. Also, some people were upset that it sunk the Rainbow Quibble ship. Fair enough. Next up is She's All Yak. 
This trap is overused, I think. And they really don't do anything new with it. I think it's called a My Fair Lady plot. Oh, so that's what My Fair Lady is. Cool. On the positive side, it was nice seeing the clubhouse again, and the Yona and Sandbar uh, shipping is cute. Uh, as My Fair Lady is a musical based on a play called Pygmalion, it, worth checking out for the songs and to get the references. At any rate, they remembered that the Student Six existed, which was nice. Yeah, they kind of fall by the wayside this season. And I'll have more to say about that at the end. Anyway, the basic structure here is fine. Yes, it's an overused plot, but it's not poorly done or anything, just generic. It does feel like an 11 minute short stretch to 22 minutes, though. Maybe they could have combined this with the other one? That's what I'm thinking. Kim Possible had a few two 11 minute shorts episodes, uh, even though they were usually twice that. Here, the makeover scenes felt like they dragged on and rarely seemed shoehorned in. It would have made more sense to have a Celis help with the makeover. Or have it be Ocellus in the place of Yona. When we first meet Ocellus, she is disguised as a pony to fit in with the others. Agreed. The dancing scene at the end is still fun anyway. I understand the placeholder music was Let the Bodies Hit the Floor by Drowning Pools. <laughs> really? I hope that someone mixed that track back into the scene. Oh, probably. Moving on to Frenemies. This has some great comedy. We need a sitcom spinoff with these three. Now see, that might have been a fun idea for a Pony Life thing. Ooh, that could have worked. Do you think they could get the VAs for that? Eh, probably not. They had to replace Spike's VA due to lack of funds, but I doubt a replacement would work here. That's a shame. I especially like Cozy and Chrysalis trying and failing to get to the mountain on their own. Yeah, this sets up what should have been some nice foreshadowing. Grover's plan with the bell and getting those three to work together is shaping up, and there's a hint of a redemption arc for them as a friendship forms with each other. In the form of a nice song that they interrupted when they realized what's happening. Exactly. I mean, ultimately they didn't go this way, but I didn't know that on first view viewing. Again, I'll circle back to that. Alright then, on to Sweet and Smoky. It has some nice world building with the Dragonlance and background for Smolder. Yeah, I like the world building too, though a lot of fans have trouble with this episode. Right, due to Grovel secretly being a softie. Right. In children's media, the trope is overdone, and plenty of times in real life, bullies aren't actually covering insecurities, but just like power. But I didn't think it was done too badly, and the other dragon bullies did seem to be pure bullies. Still seems kind of lacking overall. I'd call it a mediocre fem episode myself, but that's a pretty high bar, so that's really not that bad. Next up is Going to Seed. I thought it was a cute episode. Really? This one just confused me. It felt like something that should be 11 minutes, or maybe even 5, and in pony life. The moral of, you're never too old to believe, works for me. But that didn't make sense. AJ got so wrapped up in it that she started neglecting her duties, which just seemed out of character. She does come back around in the end. Maybe I should say, don't get rid of your inner child? Better. I mean, I don't hate this episode, I just find it baffling. Uh, moving on to Student Council. Pretty good, but I still find Mudfire annoying. I find him funny, but that sentiment is probably why he was stoned for much of his screen time. Moth's comments on Rockfire was perfect. Yeah, Mod kills it as usual. Trixie's also great, and they remember the treehouse exists. And overall, most of this episode just works. But... But it kind of falls apart in the third act. The conflict of the student out in the woods is forced, and it seems dangerously close to saying Starlight really should be working herself half to death. Well, the lesson they went with for work-life balance isn't a bad one, but it is a bit overused, which makes the first act a bit dull and... Silverstream comes off annoying. Yeah, true. Still, I'd put this episode into the good pile for the season. So we're making piles now? Alright, bad metaphor. 
Oh, great. This one's next. Ah, the last crusade. This one's been discussed everywhere else. So... Uh, yeah, we do want to keep this from going too long. All right, let's just hit some highlights. First, Snapshutter and Main Allgood are horrible parents. They leave their daughter semi alone for months at a time, not even bothering to visit her on Christmas, or rather, heartwarming. And when they do show up, they expect her to drop her entire life for people she effectively barely knows. As I said, it's been said before, showing Scootaloo's parents how much the CMC mean to the town is a good idea, but was the key to the city really necessary? I mean, things got so extreme that it makes sense, but... Exactly. No one raised any actual objections. I mean, I didn't expect the CMC to. They are just kids, after all. But none of the adults in Scootaloo's life are willing to confront her parents on her behalf. Not even the usually brash and impulsive Rainbow Dash. People do argue that that wouldn't be proper. Yeah, but how many adults just say screw proper when a child's welfare is on the line? I'm not saying it's a perfect idea, but to get to this point in the first place required forced conflict and forced character actions, so at least make a slightly less forced resolution. Right, and let's not forget the ants, unlike the show did. Why had they never appeared before? They were in some chapter books, also by Dubuck. They have no real personality there or here, beyond the single trait of being token lesbians. But the show could have hinted at at least one of the ants if Asper was too scared of the soccer moms to show both. I mean, Scootaloo's parents were generally thought to be dead. Yeah, in the first three seasons, the CMC weren't shown in situations where Scootaloo's home life was a necessary question. But the question had been dodged since then. There's a theory floating around the ants were introduced to keep Rainbow Dash from adopting Scootaloo. I don't see why that would have been a problem. Artie is like a big sister to Scootaloo. It could be like how Nani takes care of Lilo in Lilo and Stitch. I can see that, and it really would have been the logical conclusion to Scootaloo's arc. Anyways, before I start to rant on, we should move on. Right, sorry, this one just annoys me. That makes two of us. Next up is Between Dark and Dawn. This is finally an 11 minute story done in 11 minutes. Huh? I mean the A story following the sisters. Oh yeah! It was so nice seeing them outside of being the royal sisters. Exactly, and it made sense with their characters and long separation. Well, at least with some interpretations of Luna's character. People do complain about her not entirely consistent characterization, but we see her interact with others so seldom, and it has been several years. Wait, that was only half the episode? I kind of forgot the main six plot was part of this episode. Exactly. This was half a good episode and half a forgettable one. The lesson for the main six in Acts 2 and 3 about learning to delegate was fine, and it continues the idea planted in the first episode about them learning to organize and rule together. Nothing great, but it's functional. The only problem is Fancy Pants. I don't remember him being a jerk. Was he like this before? No, I honestly didn't even know he was supposed to be Fancy Pants on first viewing. It seems like someone on the staff, either on the writing or the animating end, confused Fancy Pants with Blue Blood. Sorry, Blue Blood would have made more sense in this role. Where has he even been? Good question. He was built up as somewhat important in Season 1, and I don't think he's had a speaking role since then. Well, I don't have much else to say, so on to the last laugh. This is a fun episode that seems like it's setting up Cheese Sandwich as a Willy Wonka type. Alright, that was a nice twist. A Willy Wonka who's become mired in bureaucracy. As usual, Weird Al brings it. Pinky showing him all different kinds of comedy was a nice showcase. And making Sans laugh of a pun during the final song was great. Definitely cool for any Undertale fans. Again, a very fun episode. Agreed, but there are two problems I have with it. First, since Weird Al is too expensive to get very often, this was only the second chance to see Pinky and Cheese uh, interact romantically, and it was the last. Now, in Pinky Pride, their interaction could be interpreted as low-key flirting, but that just wasn't there this time. 
If you weren't going to have them get together, that would be fine, but as it was... Ooh, them photo would have been so cute. But the fact that Pinky stopped what she was doing to help Cheese get back something that was important to him, that shows how much she cares about him. Alas, the other problem is the title. Right. It doesn't relate to the episode as much, does it? Nope. It's called that purely because it's the last season. Same problem with the season's two-parters and a few other episodes. Let's not get too bogged down by that. 246 Great had a nice cheer, and it was nice to see Celestia's sporty side. But the rest was... a par. That's putting it politely. This felt like a lesson Rainbow Dash would have learned back in Season 1 or 2, but told in a worse way. None of the students go to Twilight with their concerns, Rainbow Dash is flanderized to the point of unlikability, and to top it off, the takeaway from kids is bad. Um, what do you mean? Think about it. The other adults the kids go to don't do anything, and the lesson is adults will eventually come around and do what they should on their own. What about kids who are abused? The impression here is that there's no point telling another adult because they won't do anything, but it's okay because the abuser will come around on their own. Okay, that's dark. Sorry, sorry, child abuse is never a great subject, but yeah, I'll calm down so we can move on. Anyway, this isn't the worst episode of the series, aside from the aforementioned unfortunate implications, but it's bottom five material for me. So kids, if an adult in your life is hurting you, find an adult that you can trust and talk to them about it. Nothing's ever a guarantee, because real life is not like a cartoon. Well said. And next up is a Trivial Pursuit. Does Hasbro own Trivial Pursuit? Let's see. Uh, they do. It's easy to forget they bought Parker Brothers at some point. Although you can buy the original uh, 1981 Master Game Genius Edition on eBay, which I actually used to own. Actually, it's Genius Edition. That's a common mistake. Regardless... We have here what would have been a good episode back in Season 2, save for the presence of Sunburst, and really nearly anyone could have filled his role. Twilight's never been shown as this competitive, but back then it would have been a reasonable introduction. She does push herself. I mean, it's just like how she acted in the episode Lesson Zero. Yes, but in the past it's always been competing against herself in some sense. At least Twilight doesn't come across as unlikable as Rainbow Dash did last episode. Uh, partly because it's a game that people don't devote as much time to as sports and cheerleading. Yeah, as much as I like seeing crazy Twilight again, the episode was just not fun when it really should have been. I think it's that Twilight takes too long to realize Pinky is hurt, so we have to suffer through hurt feelings Pinkie Pie for way longer than is comfortable. Still, I'm someone who just doesn't like when people, or in this case, ponies, are too competitive. I do like the sound when Pinky's cutie mark falls into the bowl. I think it's inspired by Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Did some pony say millionaire? Yeah! Where did you come from? That's a good question. Where does any game show host come from? Anyway, I believe you had a question about millionaire. Okay, Bubble. I was wondering about that musical cue from A Trivial Pursuit. Hmm, that's definitely inspired by it, at least. Uh, here, take a listen to the millionaire one. I think it's just transposed to a minor key? It may need a music expert on this. Ah, yeah, it's just transposed down a half step. The original is C-sharp minor, and this is C minor. There's some little differences, too. Hey, don't thank me. Thank MuseScript. She's the one who told me that. Ah, uh, I wonder if the change is a slip past copyright. Maybe, but it's closer than that yakety sex sound alike from that episode with Phil Philomena. Huh. Well, let's leave that for now. Uh, thanks for coming, Bobby. Hey, no problem. Oh, don't forget you're on my show next. Right, right, I remember. Until then. Uh, it, anyway, plus sides on this episode. Sunburst is in decent form, as are Maud and Mudbriar, but Granny Smith really kills it. <laughs> she does a great job here. Now we just need a supercut of just her parts in the episode. Shh, we don't want another YouTuber popping up. 
<laughs> right, right. Let's move on to the Summer Sun setback. Huh. What is it? I can't actually remember what happens here. Something about a Summer Sun celebration? Right. Turning it into the Festival of the Two Sisters. And the villain's running around doing something I don't remember. Right, it's supposed to set them up for the final two-parter. The villains find some information, but that's it. And looking back at it, they spend far too long focusing on them. Unlike Frenemies, they aren't really interesting, and their whole bit really could have been done in a few minutes. Oh yeah, now I remember. There were the defenses from Sparkle 7. Alright, so there were. The main six were also doing something? Dealing with the trouble the villains were causing? Yeah, maybe this should have been right before the finale. Maybe, but the finale was stretched out as it was. I'm guessing this is one of those episodes they had to make up after most of the staff left? At least it doesn't make any of the characters unlikable. True, but that's about all I can say for it. It's ultimately just forgettable, which is worse than being bad in some cases. Let's not dwell on this one too much. Next is, she talks to angels. Oh, a body swap episode? And they didn't swap voices, which is always a plus. Not that Angel had a voice to begin with. But you always know it's Angel using Fluttershy's voice, and not really Fluttershy. Well, this is the same VA who manages to do both Pinkie Pie and Fluttershy. Adding to her repertoire. It is cool to see Sakura and the Animal Sanctuary again, too. Potions that swap bodies is kind of lazy, though. Wouldn't it make more sense for a Starlight spell to do this? Maybe the writers wanted a secret from the rest of the main six and have it focus on Fluttershy and Angel? Yeah, if they had done anything with that, I'd agree, but they really didn't. More to the point, this implies Angel is sapient, so what about those pigs Applejack keeps? I'm not sure I want to think about that too hard, but it does make you wonder why Angel is treated like a pet. And are, say, Winona or Tank really sapient? I don't know about Winona, but Tank sure seems to know his stuff, and Gummy definitely is. Yeah, Fritologic abounds here. It it also seems like something Discord could have done rather than Sakura. But then he could just swap them back. Also, he doesn't like Angel from what I remember, so why would he put someone he likes into the body of someone he doesn't? Yeah, eh, just introduce another plot device to cover that one. It would feel slightly less contrived. Well, that aside, this it's a nice episode. It just feels like something that should have ran several seasons earlier when we were actually seeing Angel being a jerk. For that matter, he doesn't really learn his lesson here. I mean, he does, but the lesson learned doesn't really relate to the experience. Eh, fair enough. On to Dragon Dropped. The idea here is decent until about the last two minutes. I don't know that I'd give it that much credit. Wow, you're being harsher on an episode than me? Am I? Look, Rarity has never treated Spike well, and this showcases it. When she tries to do everything she used to do with Spike without him... We see just how much she uses him, and she doesn't realize and or just doesn't care. Yeah, Rarity's jealousy of a friend's time, whether or not it's a romantic interest, isn't portrayed too terribly in my opinion. I mean, it's not done great, but I didn't find Rarity actively unlikable, and Gabby was portrayed well. It was nice seeing Gabby again. She's a great character and was sadly underused. Right, and they were on the verge of sinking the slightly creepy Rarity Spike ship. Most of the episode looked like they were showing that that wasn't their relationship, that his infatuation and Rarity's possessiveness had created an almost parasitic relationship that was barely tolerable as friends, but would have been toxic as lovers. You might be reading too much into it, but I suppose it doesn't give the best idea of how to maturely approach romance to a young viewer. 
Very little media does, really. Some anime I can think of do a good job, but that's another discussion. Anyway, the episode swerves the other way in the last few minutes to leave the rarity Spike ship an open possibility, which just felt jarring. I didn't mind when it was just Spike having a crush on Rarity, but the moment Rarity started to use Spike as a literal and figurative pincushion, I felt uncomfortable. And just to be clear, I don't really care if others ship them. I just don't get why. It's just that the relationship betrayed here is not a good one. Agreed. Next up is a horseshoe-in. A horrible pun, but the episode itself was pretty funny, and not much else. Uh, I don't really have much of an impression of this one. It just felt like filler. Well, it did address the school that was just introduced last season, and always had the problem of having teachers with other full-time jobs. Oh yeah, aren't you a teacher? Intermittently. Let's just say I know full well that even in a world of magical ponies, the notion that they could teach and do their other jobs was already a stretch. Add government on top of it and it completely breaks the fiction. If this episode had dealt with all the teachers leaving at once, it might have worked better. Hmm, maybe. But let's get back to the actual episode and not a hypothetical version. Right, right. Well, first off, they should have brought Sunburst in earlier. I saw the ending coming a mile off, and by trying to make it a surprise, it just seems nepotistic. And also, there's no competition for the counselor job for some reason. Why would she make a good counselor anyways? She's a show pony, and as such, likes to be a center of attention. A counselor shouldn't do that. And she's sometimes vain, which I guess would make her good at dealing with griffins, since they seem to respect bravado. But there's only the one griffin student. Maybe they could have made her an ambassador to Griffinstone. Although I will say that it's strange that Trixie still gets a job even though she acted poorly. Eh, ambassadorship might work. Also, this episode coming close to the end kind of highlights how little Twilight's opinion mattered in all of this. Season 8 made it seem like the school was her long-term place and like she had finally found a dream of her own to aspire to. Something the other main six had, but she kind of didn't. Now she's kicked upstairs and abandons that. Can I get in ahead of ourselves, though? Right, right. Not much else to say, but poor Phyllis. We hardly knew you! Up next is Daring Doubt. This one's enjoyable, but bland. Contentious, too. I didn't find it bad, really. It was nice seeing Fluttershy and Rainbow Dash paired up again. It's been a while since we had an episode with just these two. Nothing else really stood out to me. I'll quickly summarize. Basically, it's fine at the start, shows legitimate conflict, and has logical character moments. It's only in the last few minutes that it falls apart. You said that a lot about the season. Yeah, and it's across multiple writers, so I'm thinking it's on the editorial side. It's more common with the ones Dubik wrote, and she was supposedly the effective showrunner, So I think she either doesn't know how to end a story or doesn't know how to compress an idea into 22 minutes. The truth talisman here was a plot device purely to keep fans from speculating that Caballeron and Aoizota were lying. Caballeron's goons are forming is fine, and it's built up over the episode, but Caballeron's isn't and seems to come out of nowhere. Aoizota protecting artifacts sort of makes sense, uh, if you then also recognize that he was concerned about that and nothing else making him more true neutral than evil or good. His plans, like 1,000 years of scorching heat, would inevitably kill any sapient creatures, but if we take him as being concerned with just the one thing, artifacts, then it's fine. But then suddenly, nope, he's good all along. Again, ignores his complete lack of concern for bystanders' lives. It's similar to Caballeron if we pull the rival card, Neutral, fine. Good, too much of a stretch. He had more screen time before this, so while this also makes him more sympathetic, it also made it more clear that Caballeron didn't actually care about other ponies' safety. Um, that's a problem. It's like the episode doesn't consider any of the previous Darren Do episodes canon. Maybe. I think it's forcing Dubok's agenda here, trying to teach a lesson about plundering of cultural artifacts. 
which is a good lesson in the real world, but the real world doesn't have magical cursed artifacts that can render large swaths of land uninhabitable. You can't sacrifice suspension of disbelief for the sake of a lesson, or it just comes across as phony. That makes sense, but this is going on for a while. Maybe we should move on. Right, sorry. At least we're almost through. Next up is Growing Up is Hard to Do. This would have been a good season 5 or 6 episode. Just after they got their cutie marks, them thinking, where are adults now? Would have made much more sense. It would have been better than certainly, but the execution is so cringe, I'm not sure that it would have saved it. Why the random plot device flower? Couldn't it have been an apple bloom potion or discord shenanigans? If Discord was trying to teach them a lesson and had himself as a safety net, the adult's behavior here would have made more sense. Yeah, but that's pretty much what they did for the finale. Right, but that was out of nowhere. This would have foreshadowed it. And then the song and the message they are given is about how it's enough to be big, even though logically adults would also have had trouble with many of the things they have trouble with in this episode. It's just so forced. They're trying so hard to make a lesson for children that they forget to make it feel real. Children are ignorant of the world, but not stupid. Like Mr. Rogers said, kids can spot a phony a mile away. I mean, it's hard to match Mr. Rogers. Okay, granted. Anyway, the ideas are mostly good, even if the execution is so cringeworthy they have trouble watching it. And just as a side note, because I say so is not a good way to deal with a child. They never really come back around to that, with the adults never really explaining why they didn't want them to do whatever. It's human nature not to want to be told what to do. I mean, I agree, but it is something kids hear a lot. I used to say it to my siblings and my brother-in-law, who normally would sit down with my nephew and explain to him why he couldn't do something, has said, because I said so, in moments where he just didn't have time or energy to explain it. So I don't blame parents who say this on occasion, which brings it back to the main six and the fact that not even one of them could sit down and talk to the CMC. Fluttershy would have been perfect for that. All good points. Really, any of the ponies would have worked. Heck, they could have even brought it back up at the end. Anyways, definitely not the best CMC episode. Yeah, let's move on to something a bit less controversial. The Big Mac question. This is such a sweet episode! I'm not crazy about how late into the season it was. It would have been nice to see an episode with them as a new married couple navigating things. Sure, although I have a strange feeling this episode wouldn't have even been done if it weren't the final season. Maybe, but I hope not. I am a bit disappointed that AJ didn't play a role into the proposal. Or even get a line? That is by far the most jarring part. The flashback format is a bit odd, but Discord's editorializing is amusing, so I can give that a pass. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the flashback format. I mean, in episodes like the Saddle Row Review, it works. Unlike in this episode, where it feels off. And I think the reason for that is that the story was being told to Applejack on the day of the wedding. Again, the sister of the groom, who should have already known the story by this point, because it's the day of the wedding. You see, the reason why it works in Saddle Row is due to the fact that the interviewer wouldn't have already known about what happened. AG would have already known about the proposal because she is Big Mac's sister, and the fact that they live together. If the story was told to the rest of the main six, then it would be fine. Granny's dream is also a bit, uh, I mean, it's funny, but as a response to her granddaughter's problems, it comes off as senile. As Brown Trip would put it, what the hey? Hey, we agreed. One guess per video. Uh, right, right. Anyway, problems aside, it's a nice culmination of the Big Mac Sugar Bell arc. Pacing also feels a little rushed to me, but overall, it was a pretty good episode. Fair enough. Now we wander back into controversial territory. Yeah, at least at the very end of this next two-parter, the ending of the end. I mean, I didn't like the twist of Discord being Grogar, 
But on the other hand, if it had been a real girl girl, but, but the trio I was taking over was kept, I think I would have been even more disappointed. There was basically no hint of Discord being Grogar until Summer Sun Setback, and even then I missed it and had to have someone else point it out. Leaks suggest they changed plans on this partway through production. Back to the changed episode order explanation. Yeah, I do drag that out a lot. Well, at first, right after the reveal, I figured Discord was trying to reform them. That would have made a certain degree of sense. Oh yeah, Discord does adore Fluttershy, and, and what better way to show it than trying to do for others what she did for him. Right, and would have followed up on Frenemies. But as it pans out, he just seems like an idiot. Not the clever schemer of Season 2 or the mischievous but subtle trickster of Seasons 4-5. to five. It left that thread hanging, kind of like how Shadow Play was barely followed up on. That was strange. The team up here reminds me of Meet it. The Beatles from the Powerpuff Girls. Oh yeah, Tara Strong's also in that. Yep. Anyways, the semi-comedic arguing dynamic was pretty much the same. All it needed was the Beatles reference, but that wouldn't really work in the show. True. Then there's the ease with which the tribes were made to fight. That did seem contrived, especially for the inhabitants of Ponyville. Yeah, they needed a magical MacGuffin causing that or something, or to build up the tension earlier. As it was, it just seemed silly. What were they even fighting about at first? Um, you know, I'm not sure. Leto was blaming ponies for the trio's rise, but at first... Something about them sabotaging things? I don't really remember. Anyway, on to part two. Well, there's a lot of action scenes, and it's all very dramatic, but then the final battle seems lackluster for all that build-up. I'd say the Starlight Chrysalis fight was the high point, dramatically speaking. It would have been quite a twist to have her succeed. Starlight was a bit overconfident, but in fairness, it was justified. There were several points where she would have won had she just followed up her attacks. She may have been afraid of killing Chrysalis, but after the first exchange, she should have seen that Chrysalis was powered up. Yeah, and then the Pillars and Student Six suddenly play a big role after barely appearing in this season. Probably part of why the final battle felt so disappointing. Right. Anyway, up to this point, the finale isn't my favorite, but as a season finale, it's not terrible. Kind of like Star Wars Episode Two. Good fight scenes and not much else, although at least this one doesn't have cringy lines about sand. It was just okay for me. Maybe my fourth least favorite season finale? What was the first? Skull Rays. And let me guess, yours is Shadowplay, right? Well, that or School Rays, actually. They're pretty close as far as that goes. This one would be third for me, I think. My bottom three, they're... Cutie Remark, Shadow Play, and of course School Rays tend to flip flop as they all have the same problem of being forgettable, and what I do remember makes me feel like they should have been only 30 minutes. Anyway, enough rankings. Now we have to address the elephant in the room, the last two minutes or so, excluding the tag at what I assume is Pony Joe's. I have heard a lot of people complaining about how Cozy Glow was treated. Although I kind of disagree with them. Throughout history, there has been children who have done terrible things. Note that some of these kids grew up normal for the most part. I'm not sure if I should give any examples as they are disturbing. That's an argument for prison, though, not petrification, where presumably she's likely to come out even less normal. Though, while they do have dungeons, they don't seem to be used. The only jail we've seen in use was in Appaloosa. Uh, <clears throat> Personally, I'd say that if she really is a child, even Tartarus was a bit much. However, there's a possibility that she isn't really a child, but an adult with a growth disorder. Regardless, we again break what was shown earlier. In Frenemies, we saw that Cozy Glow can't maintain her facade when confronted with a pony who will actually do his job and not just let her have her way, while we saw last season that Tyrek cannot escape Tartarus on his own. And in a different episode, we saw that Chrysalis was losing her grasp on sanity and was becoming successively less dangerous. I would have 
like to see a mean six follow up? Me too. Uh, the point is that the punishment was excessive in that light. It, it was only done to Discord because they literally had no other way to stop him. Speaking of Discord participating, he broke his one rule. I don't turn ponies to stone. Right, I forgot he said that. I want Dardex to have had a, an opinion on Chrysalis. He was even nearby and wasn't even consulted. Right. According to some leaks that I'm hearing about secondhand, there were plans to do something with the trio in the next season, but since at least Road to Friendship was recorded, DHX knew they were only getting to nine seasons, so they took them out in the most permanent-ish way the series will allow. Not that that would matter if Hasbro wanted to continue. It's like the old saying, no one stays dead in comics except Uncle Ben, Bucky Barnes, and Jason Todd. I know Uncle Ben is from Spider-Man, but where is Bucky Barnes and Jason Todd from? Jason Todd is from DC and isn't as well known. Bucky Barnes was Captain America's sidekick. He was in that movie The Winter Soldier a few years back. The thing is, both of them are alive now. Well, back to ponies. I don't mind this ending as much as some do, but I'll admit it doesn't match last year's previous image as a kind and caring leader who gives even creatures like Discord and Starlight a chance. Discord especially, but th that's another video. Now, I have a longer video on this next one planned with Bobby, but I think viewers would be disappointed if we didn't at least mention the last problem. I know this one is controversial, but I thought most of it was great. I cried the first few times I heard the magic of friendship grows. It's hard to see a show that I was a part of since 2012 come to a close. The song is good as a song, though I have problems with it as a finale. I'll leave that as a teaser for the next video. Basically, I was mostly fine with the coronation parts, which on rewatch were most of the screen time. That's actually where my only problem was. The scene with the main six crying over Twilight moving seemed a bit forced. That was the problem I did have with those parts. The conflict was artificial. The season arc set up them ruling together, which should mean either they all move or none of them do. Given that the almighty Tree of Harmony gave them a castle, I'd say the latter. Uh, but again, I'll go more into detail on that in another video. At the very least, it doesn't seem like Rainbow Dash's dibs on dreamwalking was respected. Gotta respect dibs! So what about the rest of the episode? The short version is it felt like a combination of a spin-off pilot crammed into five minutes and a form of salting the earth to ensure that, with Hasbro taking the series away from DHX, Hasbro couldn't just continue it themselves. There were also the half-hearted, sort of, but not really confirmed ships. Yeah, I know people had problems with those, so let's consider the season as a whole. Here's the thing. Remember what I said about people leaving? Well, one of the biggest was the departure of McCarthy from Hasbro entirely. While she wasn't directly involved with MLP anymore, she was head of storytelling, and presumably at least had veto power. In particular, I feel like I see glimmers of her participation in the first half of the season. That half has some strong ideas and themes with mixed execution, but then many of those ideas and themes are forgotten. Joint rulership, reforming of villains, Celestia having a slight realization that she was forcing things on Twilight without considering what she wanted, the sisters realizing they preferred the protector role to governing, which suggests a role swap of sorts, and of course Grogar. There were other themes that were followed up on, but these stand out by their absence. The episodes made after the departure of much of the staff seem to have had very little script editing for consistency. Admittedly, consistency has never been MLP's strongest point, but it's even worse than those. I'd say this season is just okay. Some episodes are worth rewatching, some aren't. It's also bittersweet seeing a show like this come to an end, especially when it helped a lot of people get through tough times, make new connections, and even create some happy ever afters. Incidentally, I'll say the best season of the show was season four. I'd probably give that honor to season one or two in terms of the overall season, but I'd partially agree that the best individual episodes were probably in season four and the first part of season five. I think that about covers it. How do you want to sign off? 
Well, I can either do my standard sign-off for a song. Got a preference? We might as well end it in true MLP fashion. How about the magic of friendship grows? And to be honest, I don't like that song as a sign-off. It's fine as a song, but as a sign-off, it's designed to be nostalgic rather than forward-looking. This does seem like a good place to bring in my proposed ending song for the series, though. It's the opening theme with just a few tweaks. Here, take a look. Ooh. My Little, little pony, pony, my little pony. pony. Ah, my, my little, little pony. pony. No longer no wonder what friendship, friendship could, could mean, my little, my little pony. pony. Now that you all share it, it's magic with, with me. me. Friends and Friends family, family always fun. fun. Surrounded, Surrounded by, by love, love faithful and strong. strong. Hope and time is not an easy feat. Together we are all complete. complete. My, my little pony, you'll always be my very best friend. friend.